Okay. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, so let's start with a very quick recap on, on what we have seen yesterday. So that was the this first lecture where I tried to make some uh, general introduction to random matrices, or at least to the material that uh, I found relevant uh, for you to hear. This uh, value basically either real symmetric or complex emission. And um, we have seen that uh, it's nice to parameterize them by this uh, coefficient uh, b beta, uh, Dyson index, which is called Dyson index, beta equals 1 and 2, respectively. And uh, what we have discussed is uh, that the distribution of the eigenvalues in these matrix ensembles actually completely decouple from the eigenvectors. Values, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. This can be written as a Boltzmann weight with a kind of effective temperature beta. And the energy associated to this uh, gas of particles, so I want now to interpret these eigenvalues as the position of a gas of particles. And they can be written. Uh, like this, which actually have two components. The first one is just this quadratic confinement uh, potential, confining potential, and this uh, level repulsion here, uh, this logarithmic level repulsion, which you remember probably comes from this Jacobian uh, when uh, going from the matrix elements to the eigenvalue eigenvectors. And this translates into this logarithmic uh, repulsion, and that's why this is usually called a log gas. Now, uh, the point now is that uh, we would like to understand the large end properties of the system. And uh, a first uh, natural observable to look at is the uh, empirical distribution or the uh, average density, if you want, of, of uh, the eigenvalues. And uh, what I told you is that this object, uh, which is self-averaging, as we discussed it yesterday afternoon, uh, actually converges when n goes to infinity to a deterministic measure, uh, which is called this wigner summer circle. So uh, in one of uh, in the exercise, also the, the, the homework that I proposed uh, yesterday uh, consists in deriving this result uh, using uh, a replica approach. And uh, OK, I don't know how many of you actually have had, had time to, to, to look at it. But I just would like to, uh, before going to, to the, the next topic, which will be the local statistics, I would like to show you how this Coulomb gas approach can actually be used. Uh, to derive this, uh, this, this result. Okay, so that's a kind of alternative uh, derivation of this, of this result. Again, uh, I will not be able to go up to the last point, uh, which eventually will be to, to solve an integral equation, but the solution of this integral equation will be discussed in, in the homework of today. So I just want to show you how one can describe this, uh, this uh, or get this, this result there uh, by the Coulomb gas, the Coulomb gas approach. So uh, the first thing to, 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 to do uh, is to uh, rewrite this uh, energy uh, term here as a function of the density itself. Now, this one will be easy to, 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 to work out or to write in terms of the, of the density. Now, this one is a bit more complicated because you see that it actually involves two different, uh, I mean, the, the two different eigenvalues, OK? So essentially, this one point density is not sufficient. And uh, <clears throat> what we need to, into, to introduce is uh, a two point, uh, two point density, uh, which is essentially the probability to find uh, two eigenvalues at positions respectively lambda and lambda prime. And I just define it this way. So that's just a sum for i not equal to j of delta of lambda minus lambda prime, delta lambda prime minus lambda j. OK? And there is actually a normalization factor, uh, which is uh, convenient uh, to write like this. Right? So now you see that uh, in terms of, this, uh, of these two quantities here, now this energy functional uh, can be written uh, in such a way uh, that I will write here. Does everyone see if I write something there? Even on the back? OK. So this energy functional here, so that guy, OK? Well, you see, uh, that will be simply uh, 
uh, written in this form. So let me just uh, write in like that. So that will be n square times half the integral over d lambda rho n of lambda times lambda squared. So I guess this should be rather straightforward. Okay, so this n square here just comes from this first n that you have here and the second n that you have there. Okay, so that's the first term here. And then uh, the other one in terms of this guy, which will be simply n, n minus 1 divided by 2 times an integral d lambda, d lambda prime Okay, so this is just a formal uh, rewriting. Now, why is it interesting to work uh, with these uh, quantities? Well, the point is that uh, in principle here, you really see that I have to, to deal with a discrete sum, a discrete sets of particles. I have a finite number of particles. And this object here is then a quite uh, rough function. Now, it turns out that uh, in the large n limit, uh, this rho n of lambda is becoming a smooth function. So that means that what I want to do is a kind of hydrodynamic approach of this gas of particles. Okay? And therefore, instead of describing in terms of the positions lambda i's, I actually prefer, or it's much more convenient to describe it in terms of these density fields. Okay? So that's, uh, at this stage, I didn't do anything. Uh, now, since I will be interested in the large n limit, well, it's actually easy to see that this rho n2 of lambda, lambda prime, uh, can actually be rewritten in a slightly uh, different way. Uh, so if I just, so it just, again, some standard, uh, standard manipulation, but I can just rewrite it like that. So here you see I had to uh, get rid of the diagonal term, so let me just reintroduce it. Right? And simply subtract, subtract the diagonal term. And this diagonal term is simply this one. OK. Now, this one here, you see, uh, this is just, I can just decouple them. So that's just n squared times rho n of lambda rho n of lambda prime, okay? Now this one actually, this is the product of two delta functions, but uh, you see that uh, I could equally write it, I mean, in the sense of distribution, this is just delta of lambda minus lambda i, delta lambda minus lambda prime, okay? Because this picks non-zero values uh, only when lambda and lambda prime are equal to lambda i, that means that lambda and lambda prime are constraint to be equal, but this is, you can just then rewrite it in terms of the density. This is just n times rho n of lambda times delta of lambda minus lambda prime. Now, why uh, did I rewrite uh, the things like, like that? Well, clearly, I mean, you see that this term here in the large n limit, so I expect rho n of lambda to be of order 1 at the end of the day, and this is what we know will happen. Uh, so that means that this guy here will be of order n squared while this one will be of order n. Okay, so that means that in the large n limit, uh, the leading term uh, will be this one. Okay, so at leading order, uh, and if I just look at this n squared divided by n, okay, so n divided by n, so that will be simply uh, rho n, sorry, rho n of lambda, rho n of lambda prime, plus terms which are of order 1 over n, which I will discard in the following. So that means that uh, eventually in the large n limit, uh, what I do see is that this term here will be simply replaced by rho n of lambda, rho n of lambda prime. And on top of that, what you see is that in the large n limit, this will just be n squared. This guy is also of order n squared. So that means that the total energy is actually of order n squared, okay? 
And what you see is that uh, indeed uh, the energy here is not uh, is not uh, extensive; it's super extensive. But that is due to the fact that uh, we have super long-range interactions. Okay, I mean super long-range interactions. Good. So what do I do with that? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, to get uh, my hands onto this Rouen of lambda, uh, let's try to look at the partition function, which is written upstairs. Okay. Now this partition function. Uh, In principle, this is a multiple integral over the the eigenvalues. Now the point is to rewrite this multiple integrals over the lambda i's. I want to write it as a functional integrals over the field rho n of lambda, okay? So I, I am doing a kind of change of variables again, uh, which goes from the lambda i's to the rho n of lambda. And by doing that, uh, I will write the things like that. I will write it and explain. So this will be uh, equivalent, equal to in the large n limit to a functional integrals over the different rho n of lambda, d of rho n if you want. And then I will just rewrite this functional integral here under this form. I will write it like this in terms of a simple function, functional, sorry, of rho n. Let me denote it like that. And what, I'm, what I claim is that there will be some subleading uh, terms which are of order n. So let's try to understand what is written there. So again, uh, I had here a standard uh, n-tuple integrals. This is now a functional integral. But this is something you are familiar with. But of course, uh, in doing so, uh, you see that I have to pay or to take into account uh, non-tropic terms in the sense that in principle, when going from here to there, I have to count how many configurations of the lambda i's do contribute to the same rho n of lambda. I mean, it's clear that there is, it's not a, a true bijection between the two. If you give me a certain density rho n of lambda, well, there will be a combinatorial uh, factor that counts uh, the number of configurations of the lambda i's that do produce the same rho n of lambda. Now, it turns out that this term, which is purely entropic terms in the sense of statistical physics, is actually of the order exponential of n and not exponential of n n squared. So that means that this entropic contribution, they're actually contained in this term here. Okay. I will not do the explicit computation. It's a bit cumbersome. It's a bit long. I could, do, could give you some reference. But there is actually here the entropic contribution is contained there. Now, of course, in this term, uh, yes, uh, I, I'm just finishing and then come back to you. There are other contributions. For instance, uh, this contribution there, which was of order 1 over n here, will be also of order n there, right? Because it will be multiplied by n squared. So that will also uh, contribute to that. So there may be other types of contribution. But uh, all the, so there are actually other terms. But the main one, which is hard to compute, uh, is, this, is this entropic factor. Now, let, let, let me just finish about what this, this E of, of rho. So I can just read it from here, just writing it. And then, so this E is a functional of the rho n. Uh, let me just have it like that so that everyone sees what we are talking about. Okay, so I can just read it uh, from here, read off from here. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay, please. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the reason why it's it's this one is is uh, is now super. I mean, uh, scales like n squared. Uh, this comes from the fact that uh, initially, in my initial model, I chose I, I make this choice of a, which I was talking about yesterday, proportional to n, and I did that precisely to to have the two terms uh, balancing each other. Other questions? So what is nice now is that if you look at that, and if you want to evaluate this uh, path, I mean this path integral, this functional integral, well, in the large n limit, uh, you see, because of this n square term here, well, you see that in the large n limit, the, ten the density, the typical density that will dominate this functional integral will be the one that minimize this uh, functional, okay? So what you need uh, to, 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 to have is basically what you need to, uh, to get uh, is that uh, you want to minimize then this, this guy here. Okay. There is, however, one constraint that uh, I have not written it, uh, that I have not written explicitly, is that this Hohen of lambda, by definition there, it has to be normalized. So in fact, uh, this is a constraint path integral, constraint functional integral, in the sense that you need to, in to integrate over all the rho n of lambda satisfying this condition. Okay? So in other words, what you have to do is to minimize this quantity here under the, that constraint, and to do that, you simply introduce a Lagrange multiplier. Okay? So, uh, so you need to minimize so for large n uh, the the typical uh, density is given by uh, minimizing uh, rho n of lambda under the constraint that the integral is finite, is, is, sorry, is equal to 1. Okay? So to do that, I simply introduce, say, uh, let me introduce some uh, some action S, which will be simply E of rho n plus some Lagrange multiplier. Let's call it lambda. Okay. And to determine the typical uh, density profile that will dominate this path integral or this functional integral, well, I just need to write ds delta s of delta rho n equal to zero, okay? And that's, uh, if you do that, well, let's do it carefully. So let's first take a uh, functional derivation with respect to this guy. So I will get, this will just give me lambda square by two. Okay, where well, did I write? No, that's better to, to look at this, sorry. And then, then I will take the derivative with respect to this, so I will have a factor of two that will cancel this guy. So that will give me the integral d lambda prime, rho n of lambda prime, log of lambda minus lambda prime. And I have in addition this, oh sorry, this lambda is a very bad choice. Let's call it mu. And I have in addition this mu the Lagrange multiplier, which, uh, okay, so this has to be equal to zero. Okay? So that's kind of, that kind of functional uh, integral is still a bit uh, difficult to solve, but 
the standard way to proceed is just to take a further derivative with respect to lambda. Okay, so if I do dd lambda of this equation, <coughs> and you get simply so the first term is simple. Okay, so basically if I do uh, dd lambda of uh, delta Sn sur delta rho equal to zero, okay, so that's, well, what you get is basically what well, the first term is, is simple, sorry, minus lambda, and the other one, okay, you need to take the derivative of the log, so that will give you d lambda prime rho n of lambda prime divided by lambda minus lambda prime, and because of the absolute value, actually what this integral is, is not really that, but it's just the principal value of this integral, okay? Which you expect, because otherwise you may be in trouble. So that's the equation uh, that you have to solve. And it turns out that uh, there is actually uh, an explicit solution to this, uh, to this uh, integral equation, which is due to trichomy. Trichomy's formula, uh, which uh, I will not uh, detail here, but this is done, and this is one of the, the exercise of the homework of today. Okay, so that's, uh, and eventually if you do that, uh, you nicely find that uh, rho n of lambda in this case so uh, it's just given by this uh, 1 over pi square root of 2 minus lambda square. Okay? When lambda is between. Of course, when solving this equation, you have to remember that rho n has to be normalized. Okay? So that's another way to find uh, the, uh, this uh, Wigner semicircle. Is that clear? Okay, so you will have seen, you would have seen uh, at least two different ways of getting it, either via this Coulomb gas or via this replica computation. The thing is that, um, as you can uh, hope, uh, as you can imagine, uh, this kind of uh, method actually can be uh, implemented to uh, compute many other. Uh, distributions, many other problems uh, in the context of RMT, uh, and eventually uh, solving this kind of saddle point equation uh, turned out at the end of the day to be the, 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 real, the real difficulty. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, uh, that's uh, all what I wanted to say about the global properties, uh, and in particular about the Wigner semicircle, and I would like now to talk about local statistics. So, <clears throat> let's look at this guy. Okay, <clears throat> so the first thing that uh, I want to discuss uh, is the following. So we have seen that the, the, the density profile uh, is of that form, and more generally we have seen that for rotationally invariant ensemble we could have more general uh, density profiles, but uh, with this kind of square root singularities, which I will come, uh, come back to later. But uh, eventually, as you can uh, figure it out, um, it's clear that if you look at the density very close to the center here, uh, the particles uh, will hardly not feel that uh, there is uh, really a finite support here, okay? So if you just look at the eigenvalues right at the, at the center, well, they will not feel too much the fact that uh, there is indeed an edge and beyond which there is no particles. 
On the other hand, uh, if you start to look at what happens very close to the, to the, to the boundary here, the situation will be uh, quite different, and in particular, in this region here, the density of particles uh, will be much smaller, and that means that the gas of eigenvalues or of particles will be much more diluted. Okay, and being more diluted, well, uh, the, 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 the importance of the fluctuations or of, of the interactions might be, might be different if you look at what happens close to the edge and while uh, in the center, the things uh, will be much denser and the particles will probably feel very packed, okay? So that suggests that there are indeed, the, in, in this model, two different uh, regimes. Uh, one which is called uh, the bulk, okay, which is not too far from the boundaries. We will see what it means uh, more precisely in a minute. And another regime here, uh, which is close to the boundaries, which might be uh, the right edge uh, or the left edge. Of course, here by symmetry, they are just the same. But one should keep in mind that if we start to look at local statistics, for instance, if you look at the correlations between two particles, which are either the two in the bulk or the two at the edges, well, you should expect to see different kinds of behavior. Okay? And so that's what I want to discuss, discuss now. And to start with, uh, I will first discuss the bulk and uh, give you a, uh, or discuss some, some important result uh, in, this, in this case. So let's look at what happens uh, in the bulk. There are various ways of, uh, of uh, thinking of uh, or characterizing what happens there. But maybe the first question that we may ask is what is the typical interparticle distance? Okay, so if I just look at what happens uh, in the center of the of the of the of, the, uh, of this cloud here of particles, what's the interparticle distance? Okay, so let me just uh, let's uh, if you just imagine that you have it's easy to see that uh, you have a range here which is of the order two square root of two, so this is typically of order one, and inside this guy inside this support here, you have n particles. Okay, so typically uh, the interparticle distance will be the size of your support divided by n, since the size is of order one. That that tells you that the typical interparticle distance in the bulk is of the order of one over n. Okay, so that means that if you just look at uh, the spacing between two particles, say call it lambda i and lambda i plus one then typically uh, this will be uh, over the one over n in the bulk. Okay, so let's uh, be a little bit more precise and uh, indeed uh, assume that I can, uh, not that I can, but I, I choose to order the, the, to order the eigenvalues. You had something that I haven't uh, seen too much, but uh, if you think of the um, the distribution of the eigenvalues, I mean, it's totally invariant under the permutations of, 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 the, of them, which is quite natural. It's just a relabeling of the eigenvalues. So I can just choose to uh, order them. That's quite convenient to, to the discussion that I want to do here. And I want to look at the, the spacing, the typical spacing between, two, uh, between two, two eigenvalues. Okay, so let me define S, which is indeed lambda i plus one minus lambda i. So, as we have just discussed here, this quantity here will be typically a random variable, and the typical scale of its fluctuations will be, as we said, of order one over n. Now the question is, uh, what can be said about the distribution of this guy? Okay, so that's called the level spacing, and that's actually a very important observable in random matrix theory because it's usually easy to measure, and that's easy when you have a kind of uh, if you have a spectrum, then it's usually easy uh, to just look at the distribution of this spacing and compare it to the results of RMT. And that will allow you to, to say whether you are indeed observing uh, RMT statistics or something else. So that has been an extremely useful uh, this, I mean, uh, object uh, to look at. 
And that's where the notion of uh, Wigner surmise comes, comes in. So that's uh, the result that I want to discuss. Um, so this is the distribution of the level spacing. S. So this question arose uh, very, uh, very soon. In fact, uh, Wigner himself uh, wanted to answer this question because this is something that uh, his colleagues uh, who were doing nuclear physics at that time could really measure. Uh, now what we know is the following. So uh, if I denote by uh, Pn of s the PDF of the le level spacing, so the density distribution, the distribution. Okay, I don't want to introduce so, so many notations, so I, I usually use the same uh, notation for the random variable itself and the value it takes, okay? I guess there are not too many mathematicians here, they will not complain. Uh, I found it easier. So what do we know about that? Well, what we know is that uh, in the large end limit, uh, this will uh, converge uh, to a certain distribution, let me write it like this. So that will be a, a distribution that I call it like that. Okay, so it generically takes a scaling form where Sn here is just the average value of the, means of, of the spacing, which is typically over the one over n. One, one, one over n, yes, so Sn. I will not discuss it too much because first, uh, this is something which is uh, usually easy to measure uh, experimentally or from, uh, from numerical data. This is also something that you can compute for the Gaussian orthogonal or unitary ensembles. Uh, I will not enter too much into the details, but I want instead to focus on this distribution here. Now, this distribution in general will depend on beta, and it will have a rather complicated form. Okay, please. Yeah, okay, so I guess your question is that I should have here an SI. Okay, good. So uh, that's a good point. Uh, so in general, uh, you're right, and uh, if I want to uh, really have something which is uh, uh, which does not depend on I, uh, I have to do basically uh, a thing that I can say maybe uh, to be on the safe side. Uh, I can I, I could just look at what happens right in the center, for instance. Okay, so if you are close to the center, uh, you can just uh, let me just look, do this, and then so that that's the quite conservative uh, way of doing. Yeah, precisely, okay? So, if you really look at the center of, of the trap here, uh, if you look at uh, i of order n by two, then clearly uh, the things will not depend too much. If, if you are not too far from, uh, from the center, the things will not, will not change too much. The reason is that if you look at what happens on a scale of order one over n, well, the density basically is constant, and therefore, this mean spacing uh, will, 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 be, uh, will, will, will not depend on the exact value of the index. Now, it's clear that if you look at what happens here and there, which is also still in the bulk, well, things might be different, but the only thing that will be, there will be just a, a renormalizing scale uh, uh, between the two, which takes into account the fact that the density at this stage uh, is not the same at that one. So the correct, the, the correct object that you should look at is this S renormalized by the local density, okay? I don't want to enter too much into this detail, but, but, but it's an important question indeed, yeah. So just for sake of clarity and simplicity, let's just imagine that I am just looking at what happens right in the center, very close to the center of the trap. But it can be generalized up to a, a global rescaling by the density. So once you have done that, this P beta here will depend on beta. In general, uh, so it can be computed explicitly uh, for beta equals one, for beta equals two, using Fredholm determinant. I hope I will have time to discuss this tomorrow a bit more. 
But, uh, so it's a rather complicated object, uh, but nevertheless, it turns out that there is uh, a kind of approximation form that describes very well the full distribution, which is known under the name of the Wigner surmise. So it turns out that this uh, P beta here is well approximated, so it's a, it's a complicated function, should just say it. Again, for beta equals two, this can be expressed in terms of a Fredholm determinant in terms of the sine kernel. Uh, for beta equals one, it can be expressed as a, as a Fredholm uh, Pfaffian. So these are complicated objects. And uh, I don't want to discuss this now. But it turns out that for the sake of application and usefulness, uh, there is a very simple approximation uh, which is quite, quite useful. So the point is that uh, P beta of X is very well approximated, but it's only an approximation though, uh, by what is called the Wigner surmise. And that's what Wigner had proposed, and that's what I'm writing uh, now. So P beta of X is of that form. So it's, okay, there is a prefactor here. There is X to the power beta, exponential minus B beta X squared. So uh, there are two unimportant uh, constants here, I mean unimportant. These are just uh, scaling factors. So these are just constant. independent of x. But the two things which are indeed important is that at small x, you see that this density vanishes as power x to the power beta, and that's a signature of the level repulsion. Okay, so that's very important. You see that this level repulsion depends on beta. Well, this is not so uh, surprising because you remember that the density of the eigenvalues uh, has already this guy, no? It's proportional to the, this product. Right? So it's clear that in particular, when you try to uh, have two particles uh, which get very close to each other, this was already discussed, well, this probability vanishes as the distance between the two to the power beta. Okay, so that's what you find here. Now, there is a Gaussian tail, which is not so easy uh, to guess. Okay, you could say it's just because of this, of this uh, uh, Gaussian here. Well, this is not true because if you put something else, uh, V of lambda, you would also get an, a Gaussian factor here. So this is really, uh, okay, uh, in principle, this is encoded in the exact solution that you can write. Now, this is also the result of the Wigner surmise. How did Wigner guess this? Well, he did not guess it out of the blue. He actually just did the computation for a two by two matrix. Okay, so you take two by two uh, GOE and you do this computation and that's the exact result for n equals two. So that's uh, the other exercise uh, which I propose to, to, to do in the, in, the, uh, um, in, in, the, in the homework. It's relatively elementary, but still uh, very, uh, very useful, okay? So this actually, again, uh, is very uh, widely used. And let me just comment, uh, give a final comment on that. Why is it used for? Well, this level repulsion, so that means the, the, the behavior for small x is really a signature of random matrix uh, statistics because of this level repulsion. And I guess you have seen this uh, curve many times. So if you look at P of beta, either the exact form or the Wigner surmise, it turns out that the agreement between the two is really extreme, it's quite spectacular. Uh, but that's the result typically of the Wigner surmise. Okay? So this is for beta equals one, say. Okay? 
Now, on the other hand, if you were looking at uh, a set of points uh, which would be randomly distributed on the line and without any special interaction, well, if you ask about the distribution of uh, the gaps, or more precisely, what's the distribution, what's the probability to have a given interval, then you would distribution. And in particular, if you ask the probability the given interval of size f, that would be simply okay, of a Poissonian distribution would be simply this uh, this uh, this exponential. Okay, so I guess you have seen many times these kind of plots. So that's the result of Poisson, and that's the result of GOE, or more generally of uh, random matrix RMT. Okay, so that's a very uh, easy way to sort of uh, uh, distinguish whether uh, you are uh, looking at a Poisson trivial uh, statistics or something more complicated, which might look, may look like GOE. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, I mean, the, the, this is indeed, it's a bit... Uh, okay, so it turns out that the... Uh, so the, ex, the, the real result uh, has, of course, this, the, the, the same asymptotics. And, uh, well, if, when you add, uh, like, two additional parameters uh, to, to fit the, the curve, well, that's, that's how, I mean, you would expect that something, I mean, that the fit is of relatively good quality. Now, why is it so good? Okay, there is no real nice, uh, I mean, or easy, easy uh, interpretation. Maybe I should say one thing that, I, that gives me also the opportunity to, uh, to say something. Um, we have seen that uh, these models here uh, for beta equals 1 and 2, uh, they actually uh, correspond to beta equals 1 GOE and uh, beta equals 2 is GOE. Now, there was, uh, at, that, at the time of Dyson, there was an, an additional ensemble which corresponds to beta equals 4, uh, which is the Gaussian symplectic ensemble and which is uh, constructed with quaternions, so I will not enter too much into the details. But what is more interesting, I think, is that more recently, uh, more recently, it's already 20 years ago, uh, it was realized that uh, we can actually uh, produce uh, any, uh, we can produce a random matrix ensemble for any values of beta positive. Okay, so these are these works by uh, Dumitriou and Edelman, uh, and uh, the, 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 the recipe uh, which is extremely clever, is to look at three diagonal matrices, which are a little bit related to some discretized version of uh, random uh, Hamiltonian uh, for disordered systems. Um, but you can actually give a, a good real, I mean, you can really produce uh, some random matrices which have these statistics for any values of beta. And it turns out that depending on the value of beta, the agreement with the, uh, with the uh, Wigner surmise is not always so good. So, it turns out that for the values beta equals 1 and 2, it's true that it works very well, but if you go to very small values of beta, very large values, uh, okay, the agreement is not so, so, is not so good. So it's a bit of a coincidence that, as to why it's so, so nicely, uh, uh, say, uh, yeah, related to, to it quantitatively. Other questions? Okay. So um, let me just maybe finish with this before we take a break with, with the last, uh, last thing that I want to discuss about the, the bulk. So that's really a very fundamental uh, fact that uh, you, should, you should keep in mind. Uh, this is uh, really, uh, as I said, uh, in, the terms, in, in the context of localization, for instance, uh, people would say that if you observe GOE, this has to be associated to the case where your eigenvectors would be totally delocalized. While if you observe such a Poisson statistics, that's usually a signature of localized phase, where instead your eigenvectors have uh, essentially zero everywhere except on one or two nodes uh, uh, of, of, your, uh, of, of, of your network. The other thing that I want to discuss, uh, because uh, this has to do with, uh, with another uh, interesting property of the spectrum of such matrices, uh, which has to do with the, uh, basically, the rigidity of the spectrum and which deals with uh, counting statistics, okay? So I, I guess many of you are, have been interested in, in this kind of context in quantum mechanics, in particular because of the connection to uh, entanglement entropy. 
so the question that I want to discuss, uh, again, in the bulk, has to do with the uh, <coughs> counting statistics. OK, so what uh, is the question there? Well, the question is relatively simple. I mean, for the sake of, 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 of simplicity. Uh, so uh, this is a real line where I have my eigenvalues. And I have somewhere here, say, 0. OK, and now what I'm doing is that I'm looking at a box, which is fixed. And I want to count the number of particles which are inside this box. Okay, that's a very simple problem. That's the problem of counting statistics. Okay, so let me just say that I have such a box. Okay, for simplicity, uh, let me just take it symmetric, but okay, you can do anything what you want. And what you would like to uh, what you would like to, to to look at, and that's the subject of counting statistics, uh, is basically uh, what you would like to know is uh, the statistics of NL. Okay, so NL, that's just the number of eigenvalues in this interval. Minus L by 2 plus L by 2. Okay. So uh, to describe the statistics, well, uh, Computing the full distribution is, is a bit more complicated, but let's look at the moments of, of this random variable. Okay, so the first moment, uh, the first moment is relatively simple, and uh, basically uh, this NL uh, will be in the large n limit, uh, since we know the, the density profile. That will be just the integral of the density over this this interval. Okay, that's the definition. So for large n, at least. Uh, that will be simply the integral for minus L by 2, 2 plus L by 2, or N of lambda, D lambda. Okay? Now, the point is that since rho N is, uh, is of order 1, okay, uh, in the large N limit, well, this object will be, so imagine that you are looking at uh, an interval L which is not too, 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 too big, where uh, rho n is essentially a constant, uh, that would be typically of order L. Okay? And that's something which is rather expected. No? It's extensive in the size of the box. Okay, so that's. And in this case, you can even compute it exactly if you want. Fine. So, what about the variance of this object? And that's what uh, people have uh, looked at because uh, this is uh, much more interesting. So, I mean, this one is, is quite trivial in some sense. But let's look at the, uh, the variance. So, in fact, the first one who computed uh, these variance were actually uh, Dyson, uh, Dyson and, and Meta. This is known now under the name of Dyson Meta result. <coughs> so, what about the variance? So if I look at the variance of NL, which will be uh, NL squared Okay, so uh, what uh, Dyson and Meta showed, uh, they looked at uh, really the bulk, the bulk limit. Uh, what is the bulk limit in this sense? I mean, let me be a little bit more precise. So what they looked at, we know that uh, the typical we have seen that the typical interparticle, I mean, the typical interparticle distance is of order 1 over n. So they looked at a size which is itself of order, of order uh, 1 over l. Okay? So what they did is that uh, uh, they looked at, uh, let, me make, let me try to, to do a, a precise statement. So let's take the limit when n is large, uh, l is small, but nl fixed. Okay. Yes, please. That's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yes. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. 
Okay, so uh, if I do that, uh, if I look at, the, at this limit here, so what you can show is that this is actually given by some function of, 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 of NL. Uh, let me call it a V. And now, uh, what happens is that, uh, so this is a function that you can compute at least uh, in, for some value of beta. Uh, beta equals two is relatively simple. Beta equals one gets more complicated. But uh, in any case, uh, what you can show is that now if you look at the limit when y is small, so if you look at the limit of large box, but still in the order of one over n, well, instead of being linear, as you would naively expect if you had Poisson distribution, this actually, t this turns out to go. Uh, like uh, log of y, and there is uh, uh, a prefactor that was uh, computed uh, by this gentleman, uh, which, so that's in the limit when y goes to infinity. Okay, so that's usually the, the log that many probably you have, you have heard about. Now, why is it interesting? So this y, you remember, is just nl. Uh, so that means that this guy here, if you compare to, so what you would expect if you had a Poisson process, for a Poisson process, the variance is equal to uh, the, uh, the average value, in fact. So that means that if you had a Poisson process, uh, you would have a variance that would be also proportional to n times something of order l. Okay, so that means that this guy here uh, is much smaller in that limit when nl is fixed, but y goes to infinity, if you want. So that's much smaller than nl, which would be the the result from Poisson. Statistics. So what you see is that the variance for random matrix uh, statistics, random matrix theory, for the eigenvalues of random matrix theory is much smaller. And that means that the fluctuations actually are very small. So in other words, you may think of these lambda i's as having a kind of uh, equilibrium uh, positions uh, around which they do fluctuate, but they actually fluctuate much less than Poisson statistics. And this is, of course, due to the fact of these uh, interactions of this logarithmic repulsion between the particles. And that's uh, what uh, people usually call uh, uh, rigidity of uh, the spectrum. So that's Again, something which is uh, a very clear signature of the um, random matrix statistics. So in many cases, people have also uh, used this uh, to check whether uh, this is indeed, uh, I mean, or whether the, the, the RMT is a good, uh, uh, is a good uh, model for uh, the data under, uh, under study. This is usually called uh, the fact, so now you have also probably heard about this, this, this last word that I want to, to discuss very briefly. Uh, it turns out that uh, this was one of the first models where people observed uh, the fact that the variance is much smaller than what you would expect from Poisson. So the, the fact that the variance is much smaller than the average value itself. Uh, now it has been observed in many other systems, not only for random matrix theory. And that's what people now usually call IPR uniformity. Okay, so this was uh, popularized by Torquato and, 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 and uh, others uh, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in, the last, uh, in the last 10 years. And I will just want to finish by something. Yes, please. Yeah, small box limit. Yeah, okay. So small. Okay, good. Good point. So infinity. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Now that's a good point. If I look instead at the limit where the box is very small, I typically have one particle in the box. Then I recover the Poisson statistics because the box is so small that you don't see even the effect of interactions because within the box you only have uh, one particle. So if you look at the limit y goes to zero. Uh, the things are quite standard, but you need really to go to uh, a box which is, again, within the scale of the interactions, but sufficiently large that you have many uh, particles inside your box, and there you really see the effect of the interactions. And there you really deviate from the, uh, 
from the uh, from the Poisson. But if you go to uh, if you uh, again uh, for small y, this would be linear in y, as you would expect from 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 Poisson for any beta, by the way. Yeah, okay, so uh, again, uh, the, 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 the relevant scale that, uh, that you can get, I mean, or the way to get the relevant scales in your problem is by looking at the density, right? So again, uh, you would say that you have this guy here. You ha as I said, I mean, you have a support here, which is of order, of order one, and I have n particle inside. And that's what that, 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 that yeah, exactly. This is just one over one, yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, so in general, uh, instead of having uh, n here, you would have uh, rho n, in fact. Or 1 over rho n, sorry. 1 over rho n, yeah. yeah. All right, so I just want to finish by something, which is that uh, if I look at the variance, uh, this is fine, okay? This limit is nice, but uh, you could tell me, okay, but at some point when L go is very large, uh, and uh, L may be, uh, if you go beyond this domain where y is or where L is of order 1 over n, so I could look at the other limit when L now is, is very large, extremely large, but even much larger than 1 over n, at some point uh, when L will be of order square root of 2, which is the, 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 the support of the Wigner semicircle, well, there will be essentially no more fluctuations, right? Because all the particles will be included in my in my uh, uh, in my interval. So that's uh, what happens for large n l, and I will just end up with that larger l. Well, uh, this is what happens. So if you just plot uh, the variance of n l as a function of l, or say log l. So there will be a special point which corresponds to the uh, to the edge of the Wigner semicircle, okay? Because I have so L, so my box is minus L over two plus L by two, okay? So I need to have L equal to two square root of two to to to, to reach the edge. And what happens is that so we have seen that we have this log behavior there, which is which was actually established when L is of order one over N, but in fact, it turns out that it holds everywhere. It holds essentially everywhere up to that point, basically. So here, of course, you, you start to see that uh, you are really reaching the, 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 the edge, and there are actually some very nice non-trivial. So first, I mean, it starts to decay abruptly. I mean, just because at some point, you have all the particles between minus square root of 2 and plus square root of 2, so the fluctuations are just zero, essentially, at leading order, so that's what you would get there. But the way it really decays to zero here is done with some non-trivial oscillations, and this is the signature, somehow, that the fluctuations near the edge are actually quite different and non-trivial, and that's what I want to discuss, uh, to discuss right after the, the break. Okay, so... But inside the bulk, you will observe this log actually, not only, uh, so the, this result by Dyson and Mita uh, actually holds uh, much, much beyond, uh, much beyond this, uh, this regime. Okay, so let me just, if you want to know more, I just publicize a little bit our paper. Uh, this was done by our student, uh, Ricardo Marino, uh, Satya Majundar, uh, myself, and Pierre Paolo Vivo. And this was a PRL, I forgot now, but uh, 2014, so that's not so recent. But uh, so that means that this, uh, this uh, Dyson meta result actually holds much beyond the, uh, the bulk, the, this microscopic scale. And it fails at some point. Uh, of course, uh, it starts to, uh, to, to be incorrect uh, when you just arrive at the edge. And eventually, you can really study what happens at the edge. So what I want to discuss uh, in the following is a bit more uh, in detail what happens there. And this has to do with the Tracy rhythm uh, distribution. 
So that's what we will discuss uh, after the break. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, indeed, uh, people have uh, have uh, looked at uh, looked at this in the context of MBL. Uh, the reason why uh, they uh, looked at it is that uh, indeed, when you start to look at such ratios, and in particular, what they are looking at is really when when you are at the edge, for instance, you look at the, the ratio of the first and the second uh, spacings. Um, that's a way by taking the ratio, you sort of um, uh, decrease the, the the fluctuations, and that that allows you to collect, uh, I mean, more statistics. That that's that's the thing. And on top of that, um, so this was proposed by the group of David Hughes, and uh, after that, it turns out that uh, Bogomolny and and co-workers they proposed the kind of Wigner surmise, I mean, for 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 this object. And so now people have a good uh, way of, uh, I mean, fitting or say uh, estimating. Uh, what they should expect, and that's that, that's that's what it's becoming. It has become popular. Okay. So, uh, if I look at uh, the edge, uh, the first thing, and that's a question that that was already asked several times, is uh, uh, what do we mean exactly by the edge? So, at which? Uh, so I have my Wigner semicircle. Uh, let's take this minus square root of two plus square root of two. Uh, okay, the edge uh, qualitatively is around the plus square root of two, but uh, is there any threshold that I could define uh, beyond which I can say I am at the edge uh, and below which uh, I am in the bulk? So that's uh, I want I want to uh, I want to discuss uh, I want to discuss the width of the edge. So how do I determine that? So uh, so that's what I would like to call WN. Okay. Uh, what can I say about about this guy? I expect to be a very I mean to go to zero as n goes to infinity, uh, but uh, what what's, what's, what's uh, how can I define it properly? So. A nice way to uh, to, to define it, uh, a proper way to, if you want to really look at the edge, well, is to uh, say what happens to the value of my spectrum, okay? Because that one, I'm sure that it will the boundary or very very close to the uh, to to boundary. At the fluctuation just eigenvalues, they would give me. Uh, Proper estimate. So that will just tell me where the largest eigenvalue, how far it's supposed to be uh, a good estimate of this edge region. Okay, so let's introduce this lambda max, which is the max over the uh, these guys here. Okay. Now uh, let me try to understand a bit the statistics of this of this quantity. In the large end limit, you see that uh, if you imagine so the 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 the, the, the Wigner semicircle, the density of, of eigenvalues, I can also interpret it as the distribution of a single eigenvalue. Okay, so if I look at a single eigenvalue and if I ask what's the distribution of it, well, its distribution will be pre precisely uh, the mean density. Now, if you just forget about uh, 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 a while about what you that what you know about this model, that there are interactions and that we should be a bit careful, this is true. But let's just uh, try to uh, think of it uh, in a bit of a naive way. Uh, it's clear that if you uh, draw random variables with such a distribution, and if you just ask where is the largest one, well, it's clear that if you take uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, samples or a huge amount of particles, like n to the power 10 to the 5, well, it's very clear that uh, lambda max will be should be very close to square. the meaning of this edge. So that means that for large n, as n goes to infinity, uh, lambda max in distribution actually uh, goes to square root of two. So what it means is that uh, when n goes to infinity, uh, you really uh, if you max with It's 
one is a little bit more complicated because you have a non-uniform density. You are taking random variables which you distribute between 0 and 1. And if you uh, take uh, 1,000 or 10,000 uh, of such random variables, and if you look at the largest one, well, it will be very close, uh, 2 plus 1. Okay? And it will be even closer as n goes to infinity. The same happens here. And this is a fact that you can show, actually, rigorously. Now, how should I estimate the, uh, the width, or say, around the square root of 2? So for that, uh, one can actually use uh, a, a standard argument in extreme value statistics. Uh, which is as follows. So imagine that you have uh, your uh, eigenvalues. Well, basically, we know that uh, they are all of them more or less uh, in square root of 2 plus square root of 2. OK? And uh, you have these this, this, this eigenvalues. OK? So lambda max typically, uh, say, would be there. And then you may have all your other eigenvalues. Uh, distribute over this, uh, this interval with that density, uh, rho n of lambda. Okay, so. okay, so now how can I estimate the scale of, of the width of the uh, fluctuations? Well, if I want to estimate typically what is this distance, well, I will say that Wn is such that within that interval, so if I'm just looking at a box, which is square root of 2 minus Wn, well, I will define Wn such that within this box, on average, I have typically one particle. And this particle is precisely the largest one. Okay, so that's the usual, I mean, a natural way to, to, to say the things. Okay, so. I will say that uh, the average value, say, of the number of eigenvalues in the interval Wn, sorry, square root of 2 minus Wn square root of 2, well, that should be something of order 1. Maybe 2, maybe 3, okay, but something which is uh, of order 1 uh, compared to n. Okay, so that should be something which is of order n to the power of 0. Clearly, if in this box I have too many particles, a number that scales with n, that would be certainly a very bad estimate. If this is too small and such that I typically have almost all the time 0 or on average 0 eigenvalues, this is also a very bad estimate. So typically the good way of estimating Wn should be in this way. Okay, so now let's estimate what this guy is. Well, uh, what's the number of eigenvalues that I have in this interval? Well, this is just n times the integral between square root of 2 minus Wn and square root of 2 times d lambda rho n of lambda or rho sc of lambda here, OK? Um, in general, that could be rho n. That should be of order 1. OK? Now, I expect Wn to be small when n goes to infinity, so that uh, I could, I can replace the behavior or I can replace rho s c of lambda by its behavior close to square root of 2, right? Because in all this interval, everyone is close to square root of 2. Now, close to square root of 2, you see that this guy here, this is proportional to square root of 2 minus lambda. Okay. So let's do that. Let's just replace it uh, uh, by its behavior. So I get square root of n, so I will be some, there will be some constant which I don't want to compute. So that would be a 
times the integral of square root minus square root of n, wn, square root of 2, d lambda, square root of, square root of 2 minus lambda, this should be of order 1. Okay? But now you can uh, integrate this, and you see immediately that this integral here will be proportional to wn to the power 3 by 2. Okay. So that will give you some constant that I don't want to compute, a tilde, but the point is that I have wn to the power 3 by 2, and this is, should be of order 1. So that gives me that wn is of order n to the power minus 2 thirds. Okay. So that's the conclusion of this, of this uh, analysis which is that this guy should be of the order minus 2 thirds. Okay, so it's a non-trivial exponent, and what you see, of course, by this argument is that this exponent here is completely controlled by the way this distribution here vanishes close to the edge. Okay, so if you remember what I was saying yesterday, I was telling you that here you see I, I'm discussing the case of the Gaussian uh, orthogonal or unitary ensemble. If I were to discuss uh, rotationally invariant ensembles uh, with a general V of lambda i, uh, what I told you is that in general the density may have some kind of uh, very curious behavior. which will be different from the Gaussian, from the Wigner semicircle, but you will always have here a square root singularity. And because of this square root, if you just repeat the argument, well, you will see that for all such models, the scale uh, which is governing the fluctuations at the edge is always of that form. Okay, so that exponent here is very, very much universal. Okay. And in fact, uh, it turns out that um, all the, the properties at the edge are for the universe. If you look at the edge of all these models, provided they vanish as a square root, you will end up with what we are discussing now. Okay? But this is really the, the, the first thing. So that gives you the, the, the scale of this WN. So that means that if you are at a distance square root of 2, which is so f power minus 2 third plus epsilon is epsilon positive, then you are in the bulk. And if you are closer than that, well, you are clearly at the edge. Now, there is maybe, maybe one thing that uh, needs to be said. Uh, so if you look at, so the, the question now is, 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 what, is what can be said, if you want, about the, uh, uh, the, the fluctuation of, of the density. And uh, that's where uh, these Tracy rhythm distributions come into the game. Okay, so that's what I want to discuss now. Okay, so this was actually uh, done in a s two, two papers, uh, one in 94, which was for the uh, GUE and later on for the GOE and together with the GSE. Yeah, it's good to know, uh, and you will see that tomorrow, that uh, the, the GUE is actually the nicest one. Uh, it's really uh, very nice because uh, it has a determinantal structure, so we can use uh, the theory of determinantal point processes, uh, or fermions if you want, free fermions, uh, to, to do computations. Uh, the other cases are typically more complicated, and that's why uh, this was the GUE first. So the first thing is that uh, these gentlemen first, uh, they indeed reproduced the, the end that they showed rigorously. These are mathematicians, so this, this, uh, this was done rigorously. And their result is like that. Uh, they said that uh, what they proved is that in the limit of large n, uh, this lambda max is basically uh, square root of 2, which we have already uh, obtained in a quite easy way. But then there are fluctuations 
uh, which are of the order 1 over n to the power 2 third. And there is, uh, this one is fluctuating. So this one is a random variable. And in fact, in a way, they define uh, the Tracy rhythm distribution. There is, okay, there is a square root of 2 here, which is just by convention. Uh, but this chi beta here is a random variable. And this is a Tracy rhythm distribution. I mean, this is the, the Tracy rhythm random variable, okay? So this is a random variable with Tracy rhythm distribution. All right. So uh, what do we know about it? Well, uh, for beta equals 2, in fact, uh, it, was, uh, it can be written as a Fredholm determinant. This was already. Uh, before Tracy and Widom, in particular by Forrester, uh, and I will discuss this uh, more tomorrow. Uh, but what they what they showed is that um, the distribution of this uh, random variable can actually be uh, written in terms of some special function, uh, and I just want to uh, give you the expressions sh briefly here. Okay, so it turns out that for beta equals one and two, uh, let me. Uh, introduce the, the cumulative distribution, so f beta of chi beta. So that will be the probability that chi beta is less than x. OK, so the nice thing that they, they showed is that the, these distributions, they can be uh, written in terms of some special function, which is, uh, which is known uh, as a Penlevé, Penlevé function. Uh, so Penlevé uh, equations are uh, uh, actually denote uh, generic names for uh, a large class of uh, uh, second order differential equations. And uh, there are numbers attached to it. Uh, so this one uh, is the Penlevé 2. And so the, 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 this, this, this guy is, is the one that I'm writing it. So it's just solution of an equation which starts like an airy function, okay? But uh, it has then uh, a non-trivial term, which is uh, a nonlinear non -linear one, which is this cubic, uh, the cubic, this, this cubic term. Okay, now if you want to fully specify uh, the, the solution of this equation, uh, what you need to do is to uh, specify its behavior for large S, and that selects for you one of these uh, of the solution, which is known as the hastings macleod solution. So when S goes to infinity, uh, Q of S goes to zero, and as a matter of fact, this one becomes subdominant compared to that one, and you just get the Airy function. Okay, so that's the Airy. Okay, so that's called the hastings macleod solution. Now, uh, so the thing is that uh, why, 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 why uh, did I introduce this, this function, or why this uh, uh, gentleman uh, did so? Uh, well, simply because this uh, f beta can be expressed in terms of, of this, of this Penlevé Pan function, okay? So, uh, in the context of Fredholm determinant, uh, it's relatively well known that uh, Fredholm determinant can, or the second derivative of uh, Fredholm determinant, can be expressed in terms of the solution of some Penlevé equation. Uh, this was done in the early days by uh, Jimbo, Miwa, and, and others, the Kyoto School, but then uh, by many other people. Uh, in physics, mathematical physics. And uh, so the thing is that for beta equals two, for instance, uh, F2 of X uh, can now be expressed uh, relatively simply in terms of this, uh, of this quantity. So that's okay. So, um, that's, uh, that's the, the, the result for F2. So you see that uh, you have this Q squared that enters here. Uh, F2 is indeed less than one, uh, as you would expect for a cumulative distribution. 
And of course, it has a quite, uh, I mean, it's relatively complicated because uh, this one is, a, uh, is not a so trivial uh, differential equation, but uh, one can easily, uh, it's useful at least to look at the uh, asymptotic behaviors of this F beta and see how it is different from the usual distribution that we know. So that's something that, uh, that can be done. Uh, so if I look at the asymptotic behaviors, just to show you that uh, this is something non-trivial and quite different from a Gaussian, for instance, or any other distribution that... So let me give you the asymptotics of not F beta, but F prime beta. Why F prime beta? Because uh, F beta is a cumulative distribution, so its derivative is the density, the probability density. Okay, so that's an object which is maybe more easy to look at. So. Uh, the tails are actually quite asymmetric, so these are exponential uh, equivalents, uh, but this is on that side exponential minus beta over 24 x cubed when x goes to minus infinity, and on the other side this is an exponential minus x to the power 3 by 2. Okay, so it's uh, pretty much asymmetric. Okay, so it's non-Gaussian on um, uh, neither uh, plus or minus infinity and on top of that uh, you see that it's, it's, it's quite asymmetric. Okay, so if you plot uh, this guy, well you would see that it vanishes quite rapidly. The maximum is close to zero, uh, but it's something that vanishes quite rapidly and then a bit more, uh, so it's typically something like that. So it has been tabulated and uh, it's now uh, it's now quite um, quite well known, and um, okay. So F one has so a relatively uh, ex simple expression in terms of Q. Okay, you can find it somewhere. Uh, I can give you some reference, but okay, uh, this stage it's, it's not it's not it's not so uh, it's not so important. Um, this was a very nice result uh, from from Tracy and Widom, uh, at least for the community. Uh, this was a quite uh, spectacular result. Uh, but probably uh, it would not have been so well known uh, if it were not discovered uh, in many other models. It turns out that uh, soon after these results, around uh, 2000, uh, people have actually realized that this tracy rhythm distribution, uh, in fact, arises in many, many different problems, uh, mostly in classical statistical mechanics. And more recently, it was realized that it also arises in many interesting quantum quantum problem, and that's what uh, I would like to discuss uh, in the remaining time, okay? So uh, it turns out that one of the uh, um, most uh, surprising uh, connection uh, was established with the so-called uh, cardar paris zizang equation, uh, so-called KPZ, uh, which actually describes a wide variety of uh, statistical mechanics problem ranging from stochastic growth models, directed polymers, uh, tiling, uh, tiling uh, problem like the Arctic Circle and equations around it. And um, so that's what I want to, I want to, discuss, uh, to discuss for you. Are there any questions on that? Okay, oh, please. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, so you mean, uh, so you want to understand a bit more what happens here close to the edge? This is on, on the right side. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, that's maybe the first uh, application that uh, we can <coughs> discuss here. So, um, yeah, your question is, uh, related to the fact that <coughs> this, uh, the support here, of course, will have, um, will be finite uh, 
strictly speaking, only in the limit minus, uh, in, only in the limit n goes to infinity. Now for finite n, so that's the, let's let's look at the things like that maybe. Okay, so that's the result uh, when n goes to infinity. Okay. Now, for finite uh, for finite n, well, it's clear that you can have particles which are actually beyond this edge. Okay, so that's that's I think what 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 you are saying. So, if you are so, what are the corrections for finite n? If I look at what happens in the bulk, uh, I will not discuss them too much. But it turns out that there are some oscillations around it. I will not too much uh, uh, discuss about it. But what is more interesting is that there will be a tail here in general. Okay, there will be a tail of the density. That means that there will be some, for some instance, uh, you will get uh, some particles which go much beyond, or much beyond, go beyond square root of two. Now, how much do they go? Well, the scale is the same. So that means that they will, uh, the scale that you, on, on other which you will, okay, let me just, Typically, the typical fluctuations, right? Uh, there will be uh, of order, so you will have again a WN, uh, which is of order minus two thirds. Okay, so if you really look at what happens, not too far from square root of two, and there will be there will be um, described by this tail. Okay, so that actually corresponds to the right tail of the Tracy rhythm. Okay, so that will basically uh, scale as exponential minus two, I mean, exponential minus x to the power three by two. Okay, so that, that, that's what, 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 what will happen. Now, you can actually ask uh, uh, a bit more uh, difficult question, which is, okay, this is within the scale of uh, n to the power minus two third, but what's the probability that I observe uh, an, an eigenvalue which would be say two square root of two, so very far from the from this. So then you enter a different regime, uh, which is called the large deviation regime. So this one, if you want, really describes the typical fluctuations of lambda max. So that means the sample uh, just randomly. Well, typically the largest eigenvalue will be at a distance from n to the power minus two thirds from square root of two, and that's what this distribution tells you and describes. Now, it might be that f some samples, very rare samples, you will observe an eigenvalue which will be very far away. I'm saying twice square root of two, for instance. That will happen. You can ask, what's the distribution of that? Which, with which probability does this happen? So that's a real large deviation uh, event because it's very far away from the typical expectation. And that's, that deals really with the far tail of, of what, what, what you would get here. So I don't know, for instance, I put two square root of two, I mean, just to, uh, to fix the idea. And in this range, the distribution then becomes much smaller and it actually scales like exponential of minus n times some function. So if you ask me, uh, so you see that uh, this will uh, happen extremely rarely. Uh, this may happen, but uh, you really need to look for them. Okay. But yes, so that's an important point. Uh, let's, for, let's forget about that. Uh, but uh, what, I, what this tail uh, really physically, I mean, the first interesting physical example is, or application of that is that this does indeed describe the fluctuations beyond the, uh, beyond the, 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 the edge. Yeah, thank you. Is that clear? Yeah, that, that's an important point. Yeah, uh, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. We, yeah. So, I mean, the, the the reason why it's easier to have this uh, either than that. I mean, you can also look. Uh, so, there is one nice way to think about it. If you. Okay. So, if you want to have a, a one eigenvalue which is uh, really beyond square root of two. What, typically, what you would typically need to do is that you take one eigenvalue, you just take it out, but the rest of, and the, the other particles, they just remain at rest. So that will cost you some energy, but that will be uh, one particle which do interact, which does interact with the others. If you want to have the largest eigenvalue, which is 
uh, on the left of that, well, you really need to ask all of the particles to, uh, I mean, to, to move a little bit, right? And that actually, uh, that's a kind of pushed, pushed Coulomb gas, right? Because you really want to push all these particles, and the cost for it is actually, uh, is actually bigger. So that's one way to understand this. And this can be actually done, this can be done uh, more precisely within this Coulomb gas interaction. So if you really want to compute this cumulative distribution, so the probability, say, that the largest eigenvalue is smaller than a given value, then what you need to impose is that all the particles are the left of some, of some uh, wall, if you want. And then if you want to push this wall, well, this will cost you an energy. And this energy will be much higher than just to pick out one particle out of the, the Wigner C, if you want, the Wigner semicircle. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it is, yeah. I mean, but it is, I mean, it is not, sorry. I mean, it, it, it is also described by this, but it, it turns out that this is the same scale. Okay, you could ask whether there are two scales, one on the right, one on the left. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So when I did this argument, I, I, I did that because, uh, you see, uh, <clears throat> what happens is that in any case, the, 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 the for any finite n uh, and large, well, the distribution, I mean, the, the, the probability to have eigenvalues which are there, I mean, they are extremely small in any case. So uh, when you want to estimate the, uh, the, 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 the number of eigenvalues as I did, if you take into account the, this probability here, that would be negligible compared to all these guys here, which the probability there is really of order one. While on the right-hand side, it's, it's really uh, sub, sub, sub leading. But what is not completely clear in principle, I agree, is that uh, then the WN actually holds uh, for the whole scale. Uh, no, this is the case. Um, other questions? Okay, so uh, let me finish with this uh, KPZ, uh, KPZ type. So how, many, how much time? I, I'm done already or? In principle, yes. Okay, not more, okay, good. Uh, let's do that. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> what is KPZ? Uh, well, KPZ is actually uh, an equation that uh, describes the uh, A height profile, uh, which uh, you can think of a kind of domain wall between a stable and an unstable phase, say an Isaac model. Okay, imagine that you take a 2D Isaac model and uh, you look at what happens at low temperature and you uh, exert uh, an external magnetic field. Then clearly uh, there will be uh, the, the, the spins would like to, to align with the external magnetic field. So if you start with uh, a sample which is half of spin up and half of spin down. Imagine that your field, the magnetic field is up, then clearly what would happen is that the, the interface uh, would like to move upwards and eventually the stable phase will invade all the system, okay? And uh, what uh, cardar paris Zang or KPZ equation wants to describe uh, is basically the dynamics of this interface, okay? That grows from an unstable to stable, okay? So uh, that's, uh, that was the, 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 the motivation. Uh, okay, so the setup uh, is a one plus one dimensional system. So I have, say, um, some height field. So this is X space, and uh, I want to plot it here, uh, H of XT, uh, which is a height, a height profile with no overhangs, okay, between, say, a stable phase and an unstable one. 
So again, imagine that you have plus pins with an external plus magnetic field, and this one is down. Okay, so uh, what will happen is that uh, this uh, height profile here uh, would like to uh, eventually evolve in that in that direction. Okay. So what kind of equation can you write? Well, what these uh, people uh, uh, proposed is this uh, is this equation. So the standard model for uh, elas from elasticity when you have such a line, and if you assume that you have some elasticity term, uh, would be uh, this one that I'm writing now. So that's the term that take into account for elasticity. Uh, and uh, if you assume that you are at finite temperature, you would expect some thermal noise. So you would have such a term like that. But this kind of model uh, has a symmetry h to minus h, and actually it doesn't really see that uh, the uh, the stable phase wants really to go uh, invade the unstable one. So you need to have a term uh, that, for instance, when you have such a region like that, that pushes you or drives the 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 the, the interface uh, to just go like this, typically. So, or even go like that completely. So, how can you do that? Well, they propose that uh, you may add uh, a term uh, which is uh, proportional to the gradient of H, okay, because this is in this kind of regime or region that you would like to make a global move. And you want to break this symmetry between the stable and the unstable phase. So, let's take, for instance, you could take the absolute value of rad H, but absolute value is not a very nice function. So let's take the square of it. And that indeed favors uh, uh, or creates uh, an asymmetry between the stable and the unstable phase. So this is defined in one plus one dimension. One dimension of space, one dimension of time. And this was there for uh, many, I mean, for quite some time. Uh, lots of people have worked on this, uh, on, on, on this problem. And around uh, to, to 2000, uh, it was established uh, some very nice actions uh, between growth process like that and some combinatorial models. Uh, one of the longest increasing subsequence, longest increasing subsequence of random permutation, which had been studied by in detail right before uh, 2000 by um, Dave Baik and Johansson. I will not really enter into these details, but that actually allowed uh, to make a connection basically between these KPZ type of models and uh, uh, eventually random matrices. And uh, what, uh, what it was shown is that uh, if you start uh, from a flat initial condition, so in, imagine that So imagine that uh, at, at t equal to zero, uh, you just have a completely flat, uh, so you are working really on a, on a full wheel line, and h is just zero, and then you run these dynamics. So it's perfectly well defined. I mean, perfectly well defined. Okay, from a mathematical point of view, uh, it turns out that this, this term is actually problematic, okay? And uh, mathematicians actually have worked quite hard. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's why uh, Martin Heyer actually got uh, the Fields Medal uh, for. So this uh, was quite demanding from a uh, mathematical rigorous point of view. Um, but you can make sense out of it. And uh, what was later on shown by uh, several, several people, it's a bit difficult, several groups at the same time actually essentially uh, arrived at uh, this, uh, this stage, many uh, names are uh, attached to it, in particular Herbert Spohn, uh, but others also. So the first thing, first term is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, uh, trivial, is that there is a, a global, uh, there is a finite velocity that eventually drives this, uh, this, this term. So you can just take the average of this, you will see that because of this grad H term squared, you will have a finite velocity, which is not important. Uh, and the question was, what are the fluctuations around this uh, ballistic, ballistic growth? Now, it turns out it was known already quite for some time uh, by several people 
uh, that uh, there is actually a fluctuation uh, which goes like t to the power of one third. And uh, the question was, uh, what are the fluctuations attached to that? Well, it turns out that uh, provided you renormalized properly your time, uh, let me call it uh, gamma f for flat. So if you renormalize time in such in the proper way, then uh, you will get here a random variable which turns out to be the Tracy Renum distribution for beta equals one. Okay, so that was a quite uh, quite uh, remarkable uh, remarkable result because uh, Tracy Renum for GOE because in principle. Well, when you look at this model, I mean, okay, except if you are uh, very, uh, okay, inspired, or uh, it's pretty much difficult to see any random matrix behind it, okay? But nevertheless, uh, this is uh, the result uh, that, that was obtained, again, by several people, Sazamoto, Spohn, Le Dussal, uh, Pasquale, Calabres, uh, Alberto Rosso, uh, uh, many other people in the math, in the math community. That that was really uh, quite remarkable result, and in fact, uh, it was uh, or at the same time it was realized that this Tracy rhythm uh, distribution actually arises uh, in many many other contexts. So uh, I do not have time of um, I do not have time to elaborate too much more on that. But I hope or today at least, uh, and I hope that uh, tomorrow uh, I will show you how this Tracy rhythm. Uh, type of fluctuations also arise in some uh, quantum systems, mainly fermionic problems. Yes, please. Please. Right, okay, so in what sense? That's a good point. So this one is, uh, so where is the randomness here? So the, the initial configuration is purely, uh, is purely deterministic. But you have uh, random noise here, okay? So you have eta, which is a thermal noise. So that's so the, the that's the st statistics with respect to this eta, okay? So you just if you run different realization of your trajectory, and if you look at say, uh, okay, let's to be more precise, let's look at what happens at a given. Okay, here the, the system is is it's translationally invariant. So you just look at the statistics of h of x at a given time t. And what you will find is that apart from this global uh, finite velocity, the fluctuations will be given by this Tracy rhythm distribution. So the 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 the, the chi distribution is it just does not depend on anything. This is just this guy. This is really the one that I discussed in the in the context of the, the the random matrix. So this is really the this is the same notation because this is the same random variable. Yes. Well, it will be a random number, right? Ah, no, indeed. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And so this one is independent of time, but this this one it, it, there is a dependence on time, which is this t to the power one third. Yeah, yeah. But chi one itself is is independent of time. Yes. Please. Yeah. So this one is white noise. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very little is known <clears throat> beyond beyond that limit. I don't know any result. In fact, uh, the expectation is that if you don't relation you should end up in this in this regime but if you start to have some colored noise as uh, Christian was discussing I mean probably you will end up with different things <coughs> sorry okay so let's have lunch okay, okay. <laughs>